All right, folks, thank you for coming today. My name is Eli Haynes. I am a recent graduate from the UCO Okanagan. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to respectfully acknowledge that we, uh, UC Okanagan and Interior Health, are situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Jen Jacoby, and I'm the lead for the Aging in Place Research Cluster. On behalf of Dr. Joan Patorf, who is the head of the Institute of Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention, I'm really thrilled to see you all here. I'm excited for this evening, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. And please feel free to check out other events that are on for the month of March. Um, and if you have any questions, we're here to answer them. Please enjoy your evening. So, hello. Uh, I'm going to be one of the moderators for this evening. I'm a little short, so I'll see me. Uh, my name is Paige Copeland, and I'm a PhD student at the University of British Columbia here in Kelowna. Um, and yeah, I can pass it back on to you. Um. <laughs> Uh, just letting you all know, this event is brought to you by the Aging in Place Research Cluster of Excellence at UBC Okanagan, uh, as well as the Institute for Health and Living and Chronic Disease Prevention and Interior Health. Uh, so once again, this is the 10th annual Okanagan Embrace Aging Month this March. Um, Embrace Aging was launched about 10 years ago to celebrate and raise awareness about positive aging and has once again organized a number of educational opportunities and events during this month of March. The sessions are designed for everyone young and old alike, and focus on a variety of topics related to healthy aging and ways to improve quality of life among older adults and their family caregivers. The goal is to inspire everyone to embrace positive aging. Perfect. And um, along that line, uh, as everybody knows, cannabis has been legal in Canada since about 2018, and there's a significant amount of interest from um, older adults in the community about its use. Uh, even though it's been legal since 2018, our fact-based knowledge and perceptions of cannabis, I hope that's not important, are still evolving as it becomes normalized in Canadian society. Uh, there also remains a profound level of stigmatism from family, friends, healthcare providers surrounding its use. Can you speak? And today, yeah. Can you I, speak a little slower? Absolutely. People with white hair hear slower. I can, I, I can go slow. <laughs> So just to summarize what I just said, since 2018, <laughs> cannabis has been legal in Canada, but there's still a lot of confusion surrounding its use. We're going to try to clarify some of that confusion tonight. Um, we're going to do our best to separate uh, fact from fiction with an open and engaging conversation about medicinal cannabis from our knowledgeable panel of experts. <clears throat> Um, so each expert is going to give a brief uh, talk and introduction of themselves for about eight minutes. The papers that you have on your seats, they have a little note page on the second, second sheet, so you can take notes or write down questions as they occur to you. Uh, and if people need clipboards, there are some floating around the room, so I'm told. Um, after the brief presentations, we'll take a 10 minute break so everybody can help themselves to some refreshments. We'll then reconvene for a discussion, and at this time, you can pose your questions to the panelists. Uh, we will have a uh, mic coming around the room, so if you have a question, just put your hand up, and we will make sure that you have an opportunity to ask. Before we close at about 7 p.m., each of the panelists will provide some closing remarks on their discussion, and then there are also feedback forms in the informational booklets on your seats, so please fill them out if you wish, and we will gather them at the end of the night. And last thing, we will be vid uh, videotaping and audio recording the panelists. There's not any videos being taken of the audience members. Um, so rest assured, your privacy is safe here. Um, and with that, Paige will introduce our panelists. Before we get to the good stuff, I'll just give a quick uh, introduction to everybody sitting up at the table here, um, so you can get to know sort of who and, and, and uh, what they're going to be speaking about. Um, so first up, directly to my left, we have Dr. Janet Evans. And uh, Janet is the medical director of CGB Medical and a family physician here in Kelowna. She's a clinical instructor with the UBC Faculty of Medicine and an affiliate clinician of the UBC Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Management. She has a family practice in Kelowna and is passionate about empowering her patients in self-care. 
And then to Janet's left, we've got uh, Dr. Jennifer Bolt, a pharmacist here uh, in Kelowna. She is a clinical pharmacy specialist in geriatric medicine. She works as part of an interdisciplinary team at the Seniors Health and Wellness Centre in Kelowna, where she helps seniors optimize their medications. She's also a clinical assistant professor and partner with UBC Fac Vancouver Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Thirdly, we've got Dr. Zach Walsh there in the middle. Uh, he and Zach is a clinical psychologist, a research affiliate with the BC Centre of on substance use and a professor of psychology at the University of British Columbia, where he directs the Therapeutic, Recreational, and Problematic Substance Use Lab and the Problematic Substance Use Clinic. His research focuses on the therapeutic uses of cannabis and psychedelics with an emphasis on harm reduction and treatment of problematic substances. And the last but certainly not least, we have Jan Mills there at the end. Um, and Jan Mills is a highly accomplished health coach, speaker, and author living with multiple sclerosis as well as trigeminal neuralgia. Bit of a mouthful there. Hope I can go through it. Jan has successfully used medical cannabis <coughs> for symptom management and healthy aging. We are very grateful to have Jan here to share her inspiring and compelling story of her personal journey to wellness. And with that, I will let uh, Dr. Janet start. Related to the use of cannabis. Um, I'm, I've been in my current location for about eight years um, and I have a family practice that has a large, much large, larger proportion than average of patients over the age of 65. So I get lots of inquiries from patients about, you know, can I use cannabis for this and that and the other thing. The, the most common requests uh, for cannabis are for pain, arthritis pain, so back pain, knees, hips, um, insomnia is quite common request. Um, and to a slightly lesser degree, people are asking about using it for anxiety and depression. And as a family physician, I'm meant to practice evidence-based medicine. I'm supposed to look at the research and I'm supposed to prescribe things that make sense and that have been proven to be effective. Back in 2015, I started prescribing uh, medical cannabis um, out of interest more than anything. Um, it was, you know, it was available then to be able to be prescribed by a physician for medical uses. Um, and I had a little bit of experience with it doing that, although it was fairly infrequent um, at the time of legalization. And most of the people that I prescribed it for at that time were already using it for other reasons and, and I saw it as a bit of a risk management issue. I felt it was safer for them to get medical cannabis versus somewhere in a back alley. Um, so in 2018, when cannabis became legal, it was very interesting to me the number of patients who came in and said, hey, can I use this? Can I use it for this and that and the other thing? So, if you look at the evidence, there are very few conditions that it has been proven to be effective. Neuropathic pain, uh, palliative pain, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and spasticity and multiple sclerosis. So, you know, people are asking me, can I use this? And the evidence doesn't show that it really works for any of these uses. But I'm not really a rule follower, always. So. Uh, it's been an interesting progression in terms of finding out from people why they want to use this, what have they tried. And uh, I still do prescribe it a little bit, uh, but certainly people don't need a prescription for me to use it. But I, I do appreciate them coming and asking me about it. Now, I'm going to preface my comments by saying not all family physicians are 
open to having this conversation. I think some of you may be aware of that. Um, it is a difficult situation for family physicians to be in, to be prescribing it when the evidence really isn't there. So my, it's quite funny, um, you know, again, over the years, especially at the beginning, people would come in and they'd, they'd say, okay, my kids gave me some gummies for Christmas. Can I use them? What, what should I use them for? And while there is no evidence, you know, or not the best evidence to say it works for arthritis and insomnia, I'm going to speak mostly about those two things because those definitely are the, the most common requests in my experience. And for the most part, I would have a conversation with somebody and say, like, what else have you tried? Just because cannabis is a natural product doesn't mean it's not without side effects, not without adverse effects. And so we talk about, you know, what are, what are you after? Why are you trying this? What else have you tried? And, you know, for arthritis pain, <coughs> Tylenol, acetaminophen works great. Minimal side effects. And if people haven't tried that, I do encourage them to do that. And there's scads of evidence that it works really well for arthritis. Now for people who can't tolerate it or it doesn't work, then we'd have a conversation about maybe you can give this a try. So, you know, we really, we would have a discussion about what they're after. Um, same with an insomnia. Insomnia is very, very common. Um, people don't want to take sleeping pills. Cannabis is a mind-altering substance. It's not really that much different than a sleeping pill. So, Again, we have the conversation and decide whether or not it's appropriate for them. And I, I'm not sure, I think Jennifer's going to talk a little bit more about sort of absolute contraindications to cannabis. You know, as a general rule, the more medications you are, the more likely you're going to have an interaction with cannabis, and I would shy away from that, uh, for sure. So, I can, you know, I can't say I'm not sort of giving you an answer on this, and I think it is important to have a conversation with your doctor if they're open to it. Um, I'm sure you've all had a conversation with a friend or a friend of a friend who's had success with it. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to have those conversations with people and, and see what you can find out and, and really empower yourself to make sure that you're making the best decision for you. So, the... Um, there's, there are, you know, the, the principle that I have uh, given to people is to start low and go slow. Um, when, you're, when you're using cannabis, and this is a general, I would say this is a general rule, um, if you're using it for pain, you need, you need some degree of THC in the, in the cannabis. I'm assuming many of you are familiar with cannabis because you're here. So you've got your two components, the CBD and the THC, and the CBD is the more, it, has, it doesn't have the mind-altering effect just quite like the THC. So having more CBD and less THC is probably best for pain management. But I don't even have these conversations about exactly what formulation you should get with people because I am not an expert and I truly don't have time to go through all of this. So I often will recommend for people to um, go to, there are a couple of pharmacies in town that have pharmacists who are quite interested and knowledgeable about cannabis, and I will send them there. Um, some of the medical cannabis companies have uh, experts that you can phone and talk to, although they don't seem to be as good as they used to be since legalization. The medical cannabis companies have um, lost a lot of their expertise uh, and their staff. So that's, that's a huge disservice to people. Um, so I think that's, a, the only other thing that can come into play is when people are using cannabis for, whether it's pain, insomnia, whatever they're using it for, um, traveling becomes an issue. And I have a number of people who travel down to the States or to Mexico uh, in the winter time, and of course you can't travel with cannabis, so then you have to find another solution uh, for when you're traveling. So I think I will leave it at that. My 10 minutes is almost up. 
So I'm sure somebody will have some questions when we get to the questions later. So can you hear me okay? That's okay. Perfect. Um, as a pharmacist, I often get a lot of safety-related questions about lots of medications uh, and cannabis included. I get questions about, is it safe for me? Am I going to have side effects? Is it going to interact with any of my other medications? Um, so I'll try and touch on a few of those concepts here. Uh, as with many other medications, older adults are at a slightly higher risk of experiencing side effects from cannabis than our younger adults who use it at the same dose. And that's primarily due to a lot of the physiologic changes that happen as we age. We have a uh, change in our muscle mass, we have a change in the amount of fat tissue that we have, our liver becomes a little less efficient at processing drugs and eliminating them from our system, and those things can result in us having higher levels of any drug in our system, and some drugs can stick around a lot longer in older adults than they do in younger individuals. Um, that just puts them at a bit of a higher risk of side effects. I get the question of, well, how often do people get side effects when they use cannabis therapeutically? There's a big range in the literature, but I like to say somewhere around about 30% of older adults who use cannabis therapeutically will experience some type of side effect. Now, there's a big range of side effects that they can experience. The, one of the most common ones is dry mouth. That's what I think of as kind of a nuanced type of side effect. But there are a few that I think are a little bit more worrisome in older adults. Um, we can see things like things affecting our balance. Some older adults might feel off balance, dizzy, lightheaded, and some might even fall after using cannabis. Um, not going to happen to everyone, but it might be a side effect that's a little bit more worrisome, say, in someone who already is falling, already has balance troubles, or maybe someone who has, say, osteoporosis, who, if they fall, they might break a hip or something like that. The other common side effect that I often talk about is the impact of cannabis on your brain. So we know that cannabis can cause things like decreased attention, delayed reaction time, confusion in some individuals, and certainly it causes sedation because some of us use it for that reason. Again, those might not be worrisome for everyone, but if someone already is having memory troubles or they have a dementia or something like that, I might be a little bit more worried that those side effects could be worrisome for that person. Now those side effects are ones that, uh, that can happen with either CPD or THC. But there are some THC specific side effects that I think are important to know about. Um, because when you go into the cannabis shops, you can get all sorts of combination products of different amounts of CBD and THC. Um, the most worrisome side effects of the THC that I think about are some of the mental health related effects. We know that THC is the psychoactive component in cannabis. And for some individuals, it can do things like worsen anxiety, worsen depression, cause paranoid thoughts, or cause hallucinations. Again, not going to happen in, any, in everyone, um, but it might be, again, more worrisome if someone has really difficult to treat mental health conditions or conditions that put them at higher risk of experiencing hallucinations. The other worrisome side effect I think about is the impact of THC on the heart. THC can uh, increase our heart rate and decrease our blood pressure. And there's a little bit of concern uh, around using THC in, say, people who've recently had a heart-related event, like a heart attack, people who have abnormal heart rhythms, like atrial fibrillation, where their heart can go really fast. THC can make it go faster. And I sometimes am worried about using THC in people who have really low blood pressure or are taking multiple blood pressure-lowering pills, because there can be a bit of an additive effect there. So I said I'd also touch on drug interactions, and I think there's two types of drug interactions that we can see with cannabis. One is when we can see additive effects with cannabis and other medications. Um, those side effects I talked about with like feeling sedated, being lightheaded, um, being confused, happen quite a bit with some of our sleeping pills, some of our pain medications. We can see those potential um, side effects as well. And, and when they, we use it in conjunction with cannabis, we can potentially just see additive effects doesn't mean that we can't use those two together, 
But sometimes it means starting at a lower dose of cannabis, or sometimes it even means adjusting your other medications so that we can safely add cannabis into your regimen. The other type of drug interactions I think about are where cannabis can interfere with the way your body eliminates certain medications, and the reverse can happen as well. Certain medications can delay the um, removal of cannabis from your system as well. So one example is uh, um, warfarin. Warfarin is a blood thinner that some people use to treat or prevent blood clots. And cannabis decreases how quickly our body is able to get rid of warfarin. If we have, high, if we have higher levels of warfarin, we're at higher risk of bleeding. Um, so that's just one example of, a, of an interaction between cannabis and a chronic medication. <coughs> doesn't mean we cannot use those together, but often our family doctors will either monitor our warfarin a little bit closer and may need to adjust our dose to accommodate for the cannabis that we're taking. I said the opposite can happen as well. There are some medications that can slow down the removal of cannabis from our body. Um, and some of those even happen with like some shorter term uh, medications. There's some antibiotics, antifungal medications that we might even take for only you know, a week or two. And um, if we add that to when we're already using cannabis, we just might be a higher risk of having side effects from cannabis in that short period of time. So what I think is important for, um, for you guys to know is uh, if you're using medications and you're thinking about adding in cannabis, it's worthwhile to check to see if cannabis interacts with your medications. It doesn't interact with every medication. There's really a small group of med medications that it does interact with but some of them can be really important. And similarly, if you do use cannabis and you're starting a new medication, again, I think it's important to check the safety of that. Um, as Dr. Evans said, some of your doctors may be more willing to talk about this than others. Some of your pharmacists <coughs> might be more willing to talk about this than others. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to leave you with is a website that you can go to to check the cannabis of safety in your medications. It's a website called drugcocktails.ca, and it's uh, really well noted. Uh, it's produced by the BC Mental Health and Addiction Services, and on there, there is a link for healthcare professionals and a link for patients. You can enter in any medication, and it will pop up to tell you if it interacts with cannabis, if it interacts with alcohol, or if it interacts with other, uh, or other <coughs> illicit drugs like cocaine and ecstasy and things like that. Uh, I don't think it is a replacement for any medical advice, but it is one place that you can go to to double check to ensure that cannabis is safe to use with your medications. I think uh, I'm getting the flag that I'm down to the last minute or two. Jill is really good at keeping us on time, um, so I will pass it over to Zach. Hi, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, uh, it's, it's a real privilege to be here, you know, when, when I first started uh, researching cannabis, it was, it was funding from the Institute for Healthy Living and, and Chronic Disease Prevention that, that started, uh, started my uh, formal career as a cannabis researcher, and I've been, since then I've been researching cannabis for about 15 years, and um, I will say I'm a cannabis expert, uh, testified to the House of Commons, Senate, several international government panels on cannabis, and, you know, as I've been studying it, um, one thing that's really been great about it, having been a cannabis a, a can, advocate for cannabis as a medicine since since before legalization, and now that that's come to pass, and we've seen more widespread adoption. One of the things that's most satisfying for me is being right uh, about everything. <laughs> so that, that's really been great. And those of you, I'm sure many of you look like you've been right about a lot of things in your life. You're here today, so you know the feeling. Um, <laughs> But one thing I didn't expect, uh, so you know, right about adolescents not starting to use more after legalization, right about the sky not falling. But one thing we didn't see coming was that uh, people over the age of 65 were going to be the basically the only age group that really increased cannabis use uh, with legalization. Really, quite dramatic increases. And the main emotion I have when I think about it is a little bit of jealousy. Like I wish I'd saved cannabis. Uh, First, I'd have something new <laughs> later in my life. That would be so fun. But um, maybe I'll just quit in my late 50s and then start again. Um, so one thing, you know, and I like to start off with some humor, but seriously, I think it's such an important medicine. And one of the reasons why I like to, like to be lighthearted about it is because there's so much stigma. 
and I really think it's so unhelpful. Um, one of the things that comes with that stigma is a lot of questions, is this really a medicine? And um, that's a question I can't answer. The answer is yes. It, it's one of humanity's oldest medicines. There's some debate whether uh, opioids were used first, whether it was the poppy or the cannabis plant. But there's no doubt that this is one of humanity's oldest allies. And that's one of the ways I like to think about it um, when we think about how do we understand medical cannabis use versus therapeutic use and, and versus recreational use. And when we look back in history, all of the texts from, from, from the ancient times, from thousands of years ago, really referred to it as a medicine, not as an intoxicant. So the history of cannabis is the history of medicine, and I think it's the history of, of an allied species, really, because you know, there are lots of species of plants and animals that wouldn't look the same if it wasn't for their interaction with humans. And cannabis is really one of those. Dogs are another example, corn is another example, but um, can cannabis is really co-evolved together with people. We, bred it selectively for certain properties, like dogs. And I think the dog analogy goes a long way when we think about whether or not it's a medicine or a therapy. Because you could imagine a context where, where dogs might, might be uh, criminalized, right? You know, they're a nuisance, they bite kids. You know, don't, want, don't want anything that could harm kids. That's certainly one of the concerns about cannabis. Could be one of the concerns about dogs as well. And, so, and, and you know, they're, they're, they, they make a mess, they cause problems, a lot of people don't like to smell. Uh, so, if we think about this analogy to, to dogs, you know, if we were to ban dogs, we might not ban them for everyone. We might say to some people, well, you know, if you need, if you need, a, 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 if you have a medical reason for having a dog, if your vision, if your vision is impaired and you need a seeing eye dog, so those people could have dogs, but no one else. Only medical dogs are allowed, not not recreational dogs. And then you might say, well, what, what about if you're just sort of sad, um, and a dog would cheer you up, would help with your depression. So people, maybe people with, with visual impairments and people with depression. And then also, some people might say, well, you know, what if I just want to have a dog because I like it? Is that still a medical dog? Um, and, and what if you actually really enjoy your, your medical dog? Are you allowed to play with your medical dog? I, I mean, I think the answer is yes. So I think that, you know, this line between whether it's medical or therapeutic is really based um, in some extent on stigma. And people you know, are, are worried, am I enjoying this or am I using it as a medicine? And I think the answer is can be both. Certainly in, in my time working with so many medical cannabis patients, I've talked to many who don't enjoy cannabis, but they need to use it as a medicine. And then there are other people for whom it's primarily a recreation, but um, I would say really think about is there a stigma and, and don't be afraid if, if, if you find that it's both medical and recreational and that you enjoy it as well as finding it a medicine. They don't cancel each other out. They can get along, those two ideas. So if it is a medicine, what kind of a medicine is it? And it's a very different medicine than many others. And that's, you know, one of the things that I, that I want to talk about is that lack of evidence. And I'll get to that in a minute, but it is, it, is a, it is a different kind of medicine. One thing we know about is it's very safe medicine, which is particularly good when we think about the overdose crisis, when we think about the drug poisoning epidemic, and how much uh, injury and death uh, are following from drugs, many of which have gone through a lot of research and have been authorized and even encouraged by physicians um, to be used. Um, I'm, I'm looking at you, opioids. Uh, so those have gone through randomized controlled trials and they've been shown to be efficacious and you know, now they're causing unparalleled uh, harm. Not to say that we don't want to look at evidence, but we also want to take that with a grain of salt because when we talk about evidence, often what we mean is randomized controlled trials with a placebo control. That is the gold standard, and there's a good reason why it's the gold standard, but it's not the standard for everything, and it may not be the best way to test cannabis because it's very hard to have a placebo control for cannabis. And also, people have very different reactions uh, to cannabis. So it's a very personal kind of medicine that might impact different people very differently. So, yes, there isn't good evidence from randomized controlled trials, but there's evidence from many thousands of years of human use showing that it's very safe medicine. So if it's a safe medicine, in terms of acute toxicity, you may want to find out for yourself if it works for you. Um, and if you do decide to do that, you might think, well, what, what might it work for? And I think uh, Dr. Evans did a great job of listing some of the main conditions that people use it for. And if you're going to use it, think about it, you know, ideally we don't use any medicines at all and we live in perfect health or, or we don't treat our ailments. But if you want to treat them, think about your options. What are your options for things like pain? Well, there's opioids, and we know some of the problems with those. There's non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and those are, are great and well-tested. They're also uh, associated with a much higher mortality than cannabis. You know, there's 
hundreds of people in Canada who died from uh, stomach ailments related to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, there are none that, that died from cannabis medicine. So if you as an individual try non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and you find them to be good, that's great. I use them as well. And if you try cannabis and find that to be good, know the relative risks and, and make a choice about what you want to use. Same goes with sleep. You know, you can use sleeping pills, benzodiazepines. Um, they have their own association with, with all, all forms of dementia. Um, it's not a super strong association, but it is a risk that's been identified um, that is a little different than the risk from cannabis. And then you might think about mental health. What are the options for mental health? So many people suffer with that. Well, there's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and the options of those. The evidence for those ha has been uh, extensive and not very good. So those, like cannabis, work for some people and not for others. Unlike cannabis, if you find after several months of using it that it doesn't help you, you might have a hard time getting off SSRIs, whereas cannabis uh, has a much easier withdrawal. So I think in a, in, a, in a context where we have legal cannabis and where we are you know, free adults to make choices about our health, uh, I think cannabis in many cases can be um, a reasonable choice based on your own personal experience. And personal experience can be a pretty good form of evidence. Um, so maybe I'll just leave it at that and, and also suggest that when you're making those choices, it matters how you use cannabis. So um, it's, as I said, a different kind of, a different kind of medicine. You might want to make space for it. So, you know, is it something that you use at home? Do you take time to use it? Are there things about the context that you use it to <coughs> make it more effective? And, you know, that's something that you might want to find um, a cannabis expert to, to talk about how do you best use it. And, and with that in mind, I'll, I'll pass it on to a cannabis expert. <laughs> 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 well, in order to share my journey to wellness, I need to take us back to the 1980s. I wish I could cue some 1980 music right now. <laughs> sure. I was working in Vancouver producing events and television shows when I became paralyzed. And at 23 years of age, I was diagnosed with MS. The first decade after that diagnosis, was a roller coaster of partial paralysis and blindness with recovery in between. I was working um, throughout all of that and it was in my mid-30s <clears throat> during a good phase. I was producing a tribute to Princess Diana and en route to my event, my car was hit head on by a drunk driver. As a result of that car accident, I was back in a wheelchair and decided at that point to give integrative medicine a very serious try. I made some very big lifestyle changes and my health started to stabilize for the next decade. That stability ended in my mid-40s when, when I was diagnosed with MS-related trigeminal neuralgia. Trigeminal neuralgia, for those of you who don't know about it, is so severe that it's sometimes referred to as suicidal pain. The pain affected me on the entire left side of my head and face, which had lightning bolts of agony that would happen if I touched my face or even slightly moved my the debilitating pain eventually left me bedridden and unable to eat or speak for several weeks. The pharmaceutical painkillers were only slightly effective and I required my carries to use a turkey baster in the side of my mouth in order to keep me hydrated and give me oral pharmaceutical pain medication. The pharmaceutical pain medications had some pretty nasty side effects as well, and the pain was unbearable. So after five years of pain progression, I was told I'd need to have a very painful neurosurgery procedure in Vancouver, during which I would have to remain awake throughout it. It was terrifying, and sadly, it was unsuccessful not wanting to attempt that horrendous procedure over again, I researched alternatives. 
A few months after that, I saw a TV documentary on CNN where their medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who was previously opposed to medical cannabis, completely reversed his position on the show while demonstrating the benefits of CBD oil for juvenile epilepsy in an infant named Charlotte, for whom the CBD oil massively reduced her frequency of the grand mal seizures. The pharmaceutical medication I had been taking for trigeminal neuralgia for years was also used for people with epilepsy seizures. That was my first light bulb moment. If CBD and trigeminal neuralgia, maybe that's something I should check out. So I researched and sampled numerous products and experienced some moderate relief at, from the pain symptoms. A few years later, I had a trip in a fall, which triggered the severe trigeminal neuralgia symptoms all over again. Ambulance to KGH, the emergency room team found that even morphine failed to help reduce my pain. I was told I would need to repeat the same neurosurgery all over again. I'm getting speechless over here. Um, over the next year, I had three more painful neurosurgeries. All were unsuccessful. Pharmaceuticals weren't working effectively, and after four unsuccessful neurosurgeries, I was told I was no longer a candidate for surgery. I became depressed when I learned that a friend who was the same age as I was, with similar MS trigeminal neuralgia history, ran out of hope, and in her mid-40s, she chose to have medical assistance in dying. When I learned of Jennifer's passing, I chose desperately to throw myself into researching any options, including medical cannabis products, all over again. It was an important turning point when I heard a former anesthesiologist speaking at a, at a health conference about medicinal cannabis for pain management. He said that CBD had properties that were similar to a pharmaceutical drug called Dilantin. Whoa! When I was hospitalized, the emergency prescription that I was given was an IV drip of Dilantin. That was my second light bulb moment. If dilantin and CBD had the same properties, why not try increasing the CBD with hopes of pain relief and possibly reducing some of the pharmaceuticals? With support from a Vancouver pain specialist and my GP here in Kelowna, I began increasing my CBD oil dosage. Gradually, I was able to reduce the pharmaceuticals, and while doing that, I noticed the pharmaceutical side effects became less problematic, while my cognitive and mobility functioning improved. Apparently not my speaking skills. <laughs> Over the last five years, I've felt the healthiest I've been for nearly two decades. I'm thrilled to share that I've been able to travel again in Canada and have reduced my pharmaceutical painkillers by 60%. That's six zero. Now I'm able to walk with my husband around the block where we live, and that was a seemingly unreachable goal that we shared when we moved into our neighborhood 15 years ago. So if you're dealing with health concerns and are curious about medicinal cannabis, or if you're afraid to try it or embarrassed to talk with your GP about it, please reach out to this panel and ask us questions. I hope my story helps you to see that it really is a valid medical option. 
I sure don't take my health for granted. I'm getting stronger and more functional each year in my 60s, and it's amazing how grateful this health coach is to be able to walk, to talk, to drive, and to smile again without pain. Become your own health advocate and keep asking questions and keep doing it until you find the support that you deserve on your journey. I'm so glad I did.